Today we've got a very distinguished panel of guests. We have Greg Vai from Gillette, Chris Granger from the NBA, Elizabeth Lindsay from Wasserman Media Group, uh, Kyle Sherman from Fox Sports, and Mike Toman from AEG. The panel will be moderated by Matt Sibyl from Core Software. Uh, the, panel, the panel will run until 2 o'clock and we'll leave 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. If you'd like to ask a question to the panelists, you can tweet the letter Q followed by the hashtags SSAC13 and 210 during the panel. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Siebel. Uh, thanks, everybody, and uh, thanks, Kristen. Thank you again for the organization uh, for putting this together. Uh, when Jessica asked me to uh, uh, moderate this panel, she said that uh, a number of people have been waiting for a long time uh, for this. And, uh, it's a really exciting subject area that, uh, that we work in and we build software for. Um, the reason I really like it though is because it's this great nexus between um, pro sports and uh, the uh, public facing side of that, but really old school marketing and advertising. Um, pro sports teams, their, their sponsorship, their activations, the media that gets uh, uh, sold uh, through them, and the, uh, um, the marketing plans that get generated around that aren't any different than, uh, than any other type of uh, consumer-based marketing or uh, internet-based marketing or any other venue. So um, especially for the students that are in the audience, um, maybe thinking of a career in sports, this is a great bridge in between uh, some of the other cooler things that you might see in the conference this year between analytics and fan base stuff and roaring crowds and, and uh, you know measuring the curve on somebody's baseball or something like that. It's a great, great place to start. The salespeople involved in here have great backgrounds in, uh, in, in, in media sales uh, or uh, other uh, types of, uh, of marketing agencies. There's great you know, agencies that deal with the teams, that deal with the leagues, that deal with uh, um, a lot of the folks around. Uh, the uh, uh, the giant consumer brands that were uh, that you know like Greg's that are that's represented up here, so um, I, I'm going to kind of steal a, a question that uh, that Michael Lewis uh, used in, in his first uh, uh, session, which is for everybody that's in the audience here, um, starting with Elizabeth, could we just maybe just get like how'd you get involved and how'd you get started in in, in sports sponsorship? Mm -hmm. I get to go first. That's what I get for picking the NC. Yeah. Um, I, you know, interestingly enough, I don't, I'm not a sports fan. I don't particularly like sports. They're not important <laughs> television for me. Yeah. But I, what I am is a, uh, a trained brand marketer, uh, and I started in this industry in public relations and journalism, of all things, and I was fascinated by the concept of all you who do care about sports and how willingly that you will turn over your time and attention to the advertisers that support a sports and a sporting event. Um, and as a brand marketer, that's the ultimate permission marketing and nirvana, when someone willingly opens himself up and hands their time to you. Uh, and I, I was fascinated by that. Yeah. And I got started um, from a PR side, doing a lot of work supporting my company's uh, sports sponsorships, and at the time, National Hockey League and uh, Williams Formula One Racing. So, and then I just migrated over to the other side from there. Awesome. Greg, how about you? Well, I got started, um, I, was, I was a track athlete, a really bad track athlete, um, and became a coach, and I coached at Tennessee and LSU, and I was, just happened to be network with, networking with a lot of people in events, event marketing, and I actually worked with a guy who was coaching who was ended up hired at Gatorade as the head of sports marketing at Gatorade. Right. Um, so I, you know, as we all do, we kind of jump on people's bandwagons. So I jumped on his, and it was, um, it was a great thing, because I knew I was a sports fan, but I wasn't a sports fanatic. Yeah. And I had a great appreciation for how things were put together, uh, and especially with, with being and, and dealing with properties and dealing with athletes and what the art of a deal is. Right. And then I got just an amazing education at the Quaker Oats Company, because I knew nothing about brand marketing. Um, and now I can fake it a little bit. So. <laughs> Mike, how about you? Um, yeah, so I, I think a common theme you may have heard or you will continue to hear is that the sports business is littered with terrible past ex-athletes. So I would fall <laughs> into that bucket. Um, and, and as I was going through, I always was, was um, very interested to find that there is an actual business behind um, the sports content itself. And so that's ultimately how I was drawn into it. And I think as I had a chance to start in sales, 
um, found out that it, one of the things that I, th I think will probably come up in this conversation a, a number of times is that at its base, relationships um, is the platform that we all operate off of. And understanding that early had really kind of brought me to this stage. Yeah. Okay, great. I got hired for my looks. <laughs> not a joke. <laughs> So, that's Matt Lauer. <laughs> Go ahead. I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> um, I lucked into sports. I was at a conference not too dissimilar from this, and David Stern was one of the speakers at the conference, and he made a joke saying, I pick one conference a year to go to, and I pick this one because you're all smart and I want your resumes. And everybody sort of laughed, ha, 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 and I thought, huh, ha, 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 I have my resume <laughs> right here. And um, one thing led to another, and now I've been at the NBA for 13 years. And um, so there's hope for those of you who are looking for jobs at this conference. Um, I work in a group called Teambo, Team Marketing and Business Operations, and our job is to work with our teams across everything they do across ticket sales and marketing and sponsorship and digital, and it's our job to help and find out what's working so we can share it and what's not working so we can share it. And from a sponsorship standpoint, it's particularly cool because I think we have a great understanding of why sponsorship works. Um, so we can work with our teams and help them articulate sponsorship really works and we can prove it from a measurement standpoint. So it's just, it's a fascinating piece of our business um, and I just, I, I love the, our engagement with it. Great, thank you. Kyle? <coughs> Well, I'll just point out first that there's two panels here connected to LSU. I'm an LSU graduate, and I think it's the first time that MIT has seen two LSU graduates on a panel speaking to MIT folks. So, <laughs> two LSU graduates. Yeah, I'm an LSU graduate. Yeah, well, LSU track coach. So. No, I mean two people from LSU actually graduate. Oh, yeah, yes. no, I was one of them. So that's that's how I made it into Fox. I actually was selling television advertising and uh, made it a point when Fox Sports launched in '94 to make that a target. I, I think sports is amazing. I think Fox is a great company. So I made it a point in my career to do that. I've been at Fox 15 years now. Great. So thank you. Um, we got a great panel here because we've got you know sell side on 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 the media side. We've got. Uh, Chris representing uh, the teams and their ability to put together effective uh, sponsorship activations for people. We've got Mike on the global side uh, with, uh, with AEG and the, what, the 120 properties you guys represent around the world now? Sounds about right. Yeah. And then um, we've got the two stars for everybody else on this side of the room here, which is the buy side and people that actually um, buy this between uh, Greg and, and Elizabeth. So um, I really... Um, when we sit down and we do consulting engagements for, uh, for clients, we've got a, uh, a software package that we come in and we customize and we configure. Uh, the conversations always start with, um, sponsorship's a very amoebic area. Uh, and uh, you know, as we get into the discussion around today, and the measurement of it, that's gonna come in in more of the qualitative versus the quantitative and trying to uh, actually do an apples to apples comparison on some of these, these activations. But I, I really kind of want to, um, I want to go the same way around the room again. You, you know what? No, I'll go the other way around the room. And Kyle, maybe you can just define for, for Fox, I mean, what's on the truck for, for sponsorships? What is, what is the, um, what's the universe of, of, of products or, you know, what's the, how many arrows do you have in your quiver or, you know, how, you know. Well, I think it's, it's important to note that there's a lot of changes going on in the business right now. Uh, television is becoming a bigger, bigger part of the sponsorship scene because you can look at what rights are going for now, and the fact is that most consumers do not go to games anymore. They're watching on television at home. You have 16 inch plasma. You have uh, most of your games are available on your cable service or satellite provider. And this has had a fundamental change. It's something that teams and leagues think about quite a bit. I know Chris spends a lot of time thinking about this, and I'm sure you know the buy side thinks about this a lot. Is how are consumers engaging with sports now? So the reality is, is that um, there's a fundamental philosophy of sports, which is it's a core belief. Uh, the room, 77% of you are most likely sports fans. You have a favorite team. You're connected in some way to a team, a favorite one that you grew up with or it's local for you. 23% don't really care that much about sports. That's, that's what the facts and figures are. But that is a huge audience. And when you think about the, the home team component within that audience, the things that we sell, whether it's the Boston Celtics or whether it's the New York Yankees, it, it's, um, it's just, it's, it's the connection. And sponsorship is nothing more than how do, you, how do you put your brand in a place where you're at the intersection of passion and connection, and you're able to communicate with consumers on a level where they're expecting it, it's organic, it's authentic. And sponsorship, whether it's, I run another company called USC Sports Properties for 
uh, for, uh, again, an LSU guy running a USC thing. That's pretty funny, too. But uh, USC Sports Properties is a very traditional sponsorship company. But, uh, you know, we have to constantly reimagine how we're working with other media, how television plays into it, what are the impacts on the ways consumers work with us that allow us to get that brand in with the fan. And I think it's the most important thing that any of us do up here. Really well articulated. Thank you. You're up. <laughs> Is there a question? Yeah. It's really, from a team level, what, what, what's on the truck for, for sponsorship? What does sponsorship mean to, uh, to, to a team? I mean, we go in and we work with teams, and, and it's everything from you know, premium and tickets and, sure. and, and media. And, and I think it's just it, the core of it, it starts with what the partner wants and what they're trying to achieve and what their business objectives are, whether it's trying to drive um, purchase consideration or try to drive growth in brand awareness or trying to um, generate improvements in brand equity. Um, we spend a great deal of time working with our partners to try to find out, okay, what exactly are you trying to achieve from this partnership? And then we're lucky enough to have this host of wonderful assets, whether it's television or live events or in arena programming or digital, um, that we can use all of those things in concert to help drive the partner's objectives at the end of the day. Right. Um, and once you're very clear on what they're trying to accomplish, you can then start to have a conversation on, okay, so if we're trying to achieve this, what are the metrics that make sense? Um, and how can we measure those things together to make sure you're getting what you want out of this partnership? Great, okay. We definitely want to talk about those metrics in a second. So. Mm -hmm. What about you, Mike? As a, as a global brand, what's, what's important when, when you do activations with a customer? Well, actually following off of what Chris says, it all comes back to customization. Um, but if we were to take a step back structurally for us, the charge of AEG Global Partnerships was to make sure with all the 120 assets that we have from venues to the teams to the live concerts, what, it, what you may, that we consolidate it all, that we can actually leverage that platform from a standpoint of when we sit down with the prospective customer or our current relationship that we have everything that we know that we can bring to the table from a value proposition and it's not living in silos. And so our overall charge was really to make sure that this global platform existed. It may not make sense for every brand, but that's where we can start the conversation and that's where we can find our point of separation. Greg, um, when, when, when you're hearing pitches from you know these guys and you know we've got tickets we've got this we've got that what are you expecting like what, what you know as a buyer what are what are you expecting to come back with in terms of like are you expecting a product are you expecting a specific experience are you expecting a a, a number on a chart when we you know i've been in a couple number of other companies and for P&G, and especially Gillette, we look at it completely different than any place else that I have ever been. Um, Gatorade, we had to be on the field to play. We wanted to be involved in sports. We had a lot of properties, a lot of athletes. Motorola, kind of the same thing. Um, but P&G and Gillette is, is different. I mean, we have to sell, I mean, there's three things we have to, we, do, we say it's razors, razors, razors. So we've got to build programs that are gonna sell those. Right. Um, we're part of a company that's the world's largest purchaser of advertising. We have great marketing talent. Um, we build great marketing plans. We are very, they're very, very disciplined marketers here. A couple of them are in the audience today, uh, which uh, they'll pay me for this, I hope. Um, but we have to look at this and how do we build great programs and, and who's gonna go with us? So, right. so we have a strategy in the US. We also have a global strategy. Our US strategy um, includes the NFL, includes Major League Baseball, and includes the Olympics. Right. Um, there's other properties we like a lot but we don't have room for them and we can't really build the application or build the activation and, and leverage. Right. And we, we go in and look at it different. We, we have a lot of properties that come to us and say, okay, we have, we have tickets, we have program ads, we have radio, we have signage. I don't need any of those. What I need is their mark. And what I need is their uniform. What does I need is their image. Because what I'm going to do and what these mar great marketers are going to do is going to put in great um, FMOT, which we curse in the first moment of truth in store. We're going to build great advertising. Uh, we're going to do great digital. And we're going to do a great interaction and social. And all, and we'll do something possibly in and around the venue, in the venues. Right. Um, and then, you know, our guys are really smart. They think the properties should be paying us for that. Um, because of what we do and what, what the impact is. Now, we're not quite there, but right. um, you know, it, it makes it a unique conversation. Okay, thank you. 
Elizabeth, what are your clients asking for in terms of return on investment? Prove to me that, you know, that, that what you guys said you were going to do worked. I was laughing with these guys backstage. The start of every answer I'm going to give today is it depends. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, it truly depends. I yeah. can, you know, the, the beauty and I suppose the curse at the same time of sponsorships is they are by default so complex and so um, able to be customized. To a certain extent, a, a billboard's a billboard. A 30-second spot is a 30-second spot. But the beauty of a sponsorship or a partnership relationship with some of the, the organizations that are up here is it's multifaceted and it's three-dimensional. And there are so many different ways that you can take it. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm, our company's fortunate. We work with a lot of great brands and advertisers, um, some of which with the NBA and AG represented here. And I can guarantee you, what American Express needs to get out of a partnership is very differently different than what Gatorade needs to get out of it. It's extremely different than what Verizon needs to get out of it. They're all very complex organizations that have their own reasons for being there. So what we try to do is focus on, uh, luckily enough, with partners like these who understand that and are responsive and don't load up their partnerships with a, or their packages with a lot of must-haves, must-dos. Right. If you have that level of flexibility that you can custom craft the assets to deliver back to you exactly what you need. Um, and we're lucky enough to be able to do that with some of these guys. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Chris, you guys actually have, um, is it through Team Bowl or is it just through your, your regular league meetings? You guys actually have awards, don't you, for like uh, uh, great marketing uh, um, platforms and, and, and plans at a, at, at a team level. Could you take us through like like what's a successful activation on a on a team level? Obviously, we, we don't need the the actual dollars and cents, but like, how did it go from beginning to concept to actual uh, manifestation of that? And then, um, how did the client know it was successful? Well, again, I I think it starts with jointly defining with the client what success looks like and what it's yeah. going to look like, and then you can sort of back into it, understanding that again we have all of these assets and all of these potential. Um, experiences that we can put to bear on the partnership. So um, we do try to celebrate the things that we think are unique or that our partners, our team's partners think are unique. So just sort of thinking back to, to two recent examples, um, at our sponsorship workshop where we bring all the teams in, we had five nominees and I think the winner was from um, the Orlando Magic, I'm not sure if they're in the room here today, but the Partnership is with a local um, quick service, sort of quick sit down uh, Mexican restaurant. Right. So just the, the idea of the activation, and, and you've seen these before, you make X number of three point shots and everybody gets free tacos or something like that. Right. And many teams do something similar to that. But what was unique about the magic um, in this relationship is the way in which they could track that. So when the Magic would make their 10th three-pointer that was then broadcast in arena, go to Tijuana Flats for your free taco. It was shot out over social media. It was announced on the broadcast. Um, it was sent out to the Magic database. So whether you were at the game or not, you could go to Tijuana Flats and um, celebrate with them. But then when you went there, you would have your ticket scanned. So right. now they know who is scanning the ticket. So they know how many people are coming. Right. They also know that once they got the free taco, how much money was being spent in addition to the free taco. So now they can quantify how many people are coming to the store, both in terms of number and in terms of the amount of additional spend at the store. So Tijuana Flats now has a great mechanism which with with which to say this partnership is working because we know from an ROI standpoint we're spending X on the partnership and we know it generated Y in new sales for us right now. Um, and it was just a very nicely integrated partnership that affected store traffic. Um, it increased brand awareness for them, which was important for them being new to right. their market. And um, it just worked out very nicely. So that's just a nice 360 one. Um, and on the other side, we just gave an award to the Minnesota Timberwolves for um, some activation they're doing with Klondike. Like, what would you do for a Klondike oh, bar? Right, right. So just very simply in Arena, they make somebody um, do something very silly for a Klondike bar. So right. every time in Arena, would you stand at attention for the entire fourth quarter? Would you do X, Y, or Z? Um, and all these fun little elements to see what would you do for a Klondike bar. But it, it resonates. It has the highest brand recognition of any of the things they do. Um, but again, that's what's important for the brand. So we take the brand's lead and then use our sort of creativity um, to come up with something interesting and then hopefully we have some analytic discipline to measure the lift um, in whatever they're trying to achieve. 
Awesome. Thank you. Kyle, um, on the, I mean, you guys are a very established media company. Mm -hmm. Is, are you moving into social media? Uh, and, and if you are, what, how are you wrapping that around yeah. your, your regular media? That's a great question because I don't know if anybody's figured out social media at this point. Um, it, it depends on what depends um, what uh, the advertiser is trying to do. Um, for us, um, you know, the, with the live local sports that we pretty much make our living on, um, that's inherently social already. Right. You're already a part of the conversation just by being with the team, whether you're sponsoring the team with the team or whether you're sponsoring the broadcast and all the other elements that we put into our deals. Uh, but social media is a tool for a consumer, right? And sometimes the consumer doesn't really necessarily want to have a brand there talking to them while they're trying to talk to their friends or their family. I mean, the reason why you use Facebook, the reason why you use a social platform is because it allows you to replace your phone or replace face-to-face. -face. Um, that's not necessarily a great place for a brand to be trying to get to be a part of that dialogue. And so there's some inher inherent issues with social. But it's important to be a part of the conversation. I guess most brands, uh, I'd be interested to hear what Greg thinks about it, yeah. but, uh, but the reality is most brands probably just want to be a part of the conversation. If they can figure out ways to do that without alienating <coughs> consumers or, or you know, to be uh, a part of the social dialogue, I think sports goes a long way. It probably goes 80% of the way to putting you in the conversation already if you're associated with sports. Because uh, the bottom line is that 80% of, we, we have a lot of facts and figures about how consumers behave with their teams. 80% of a home team fan talks about their team every day during the season, right? And they're talking a lot on the cell phone, social, they're blogging, whatever it may be, but uh, that's, you, you already have a social platform, but it's hard to figure out how you put the advertiser there, and, or, and again, organic and authentic, I think, is important for any brand, brand person to be thinking about. If it's, not, if it's not organic, the consumer's gonna reject it, and it's not gonna be effective. Right. So. Okay, thanks, Carl. Yeah, as a, as a guy that builds software for pretty well everybody on this panel, other than, then Greg, um, I won't ask Greg every question, but it's, uh, I do want to um, ask you, Greg, like, how do you, how do you start outside of, um, you know, maybe uh, some of the great stuff that Chris said around somebody actually walking in a store with a coupon and you can scan it and you can measure it. How do you, how do you benchmark great relationships with brands and teams and stuff like that? I, you know, I'm not sure I have the complete answer to that. We, I mean, we have one real one relationship with one team, um, and it's our Patriots mm -hmm. here, uh, and that's an outstanding relationship with Gillette Stadium and 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 the and the, the family and um, the, the people who work there. They're just just top notch folks, and you know, we're able. To, we well, this year we were able, we every year we try to do a little bit more, especially in the social space there, where we're talking to their fans. They give us great access to those fans. Uh, this year, we were able to do some playoff tickets and give some tickets away. Uh, we were able to do a lot of things with the NFL with Super Bowl tickets. Unfortunately, the Patriots weren't there to, for us to give pa Patriots Super Bowl tickets away. Um, so we try to interact with with our with our just our customers, but we use sports. Sports is our is in our heritage. We're, we've been using sports for a hundred years. So no one asks why Gillette is in sports. It just kind of we've been doing it so long. Nobody's asking that question. But we're, but we're reaching our audience there too because we are reaching men. We do reach women as well, um, but it's also something that people are paying attention to in real time. So I'm not, I'm not sure I answered your question at all, but I it's spun it pretty well. <laughs> I, I know it's so hard. It's, I was actually asking you because yeah. I have no idea. I have no <laughs> idea. I mean, I don't think we know either. So you know, we yeah. we got a lot of smart people at PNG are trying to figure that out. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm sure they'll send us a memo and a process for it. So <laughs> we'll, we'll try from there. Okay, thank you. Elizabeth, you're in the middle between the sell side and buy side and, and, and everybody's coming to you and, and you know, you're, you're like a venture capitalist. The whole world of people with great ideas and stuff like that is all coming to you saying, listen, put this into your milieu and, and you know, pitch this to your clients and stuff like that. What's What's happening in sponsorship? What's what's different? What's you know? I mean, it, like experientials. Yeah, everybody's experiential, yep. experiential, experiential. It's harder to compare against other things, and you know, using all these team assets and stuff like that. What's after experiential? Can I say it depends again? Yeah. Um, <laughs> no. To be honest with you, to a certain extent, I think the recession uh, was a good thing that happened to our industry because it take it took people. 
uh, back to the fundamentals of why brands are investing in properties to begin with. Yeah. Uh, and people, all of a sudden, a whole genre of properties who were relatively rigid in how they worked with their sponsors, all of a sudden were not, um, out of necessity to a certain extent. Um, but I think that ultimately ended up resetting the dialogue between brands and sponsors, and that's the biggest shift that I've seen, and I've been very pleased to see that it hasn't particularly gone back if, with the economy in a little bit of improvement. Um, people, the best relationships are the ones, their best partners, and I'm a little different, I mean, I actually have a set that are my favorites and a set that are not, yeah. um, but the best partners uh, are the ones who are responsive and actually take the time to listen. Yeah. And uh, one of my favorite examples ever is actually uh, Boston Celtics. Um, so an NBA example where for the first time in 20 years in this business, someone called me up without a predetermined deck in their hands. They called me up and said, what do you need? Tell me what you're trying to accomplish. And they actually listened to that concept. Most of the time people say, what do you need? What are you trying to accomplish? And if I say, well, I'm representing American Express and they are one of the top 10 brands in the world, most recognized logo, I don't need branding and signage and awareness, right. to your point, Greg. Yeah. And they're like, okay, got it, got it. And then Get the proposal it. will immediately yeah. come back heavied up with uh, a bunch of signage in the stadium. So there's a difference between hearing and actually listening. And the ones who are doing a good job are the ones who actually listen and custom tailor what I need for my clients. Thank you. One, one of our clients uh, um, and was going to be one of the panelists uh, um, on, on, on the panel, so, uh, They've been doing a lot of prospecting in Asia, and um, I've been begging just to at least carry their bags to see, <laughs> you know, what you know is going on over there. Um, Mike, I'm really interested um, in in your point of view. Uh, Asian businesses coming over here, stuff that they're doing differently. You know, you guys run the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, and a, that's in Shanghai, right? Correct. Yeah, and a lot of other properties over there. You're investing in new properties over there. Is it different over there? Um, <laughs> yes. Um, no, I, I think the great thing for, for this discussion is that all the different platforms, assets that we have worldwide, they're different. I, I think it, it depends. They're, they're all different. The culture's different. Business is conducted in a different manner. Um, certainly goals and objectives are different. But the, the unique thing is that you can at least have a benchmark for success on certain assets, so you start with the reference point. Right. So we're, we're building a new building in um, Dalian. And in a lot of the places that we're, we're uh, investing in, uh, like Brazil, there's no reference point for suites. Right. Or sponsor. Like it's, it's, it, there's, which depending on how you look at it, that can be great or challenging, right? There's no reference point. So how, which way? Yeah, you got to create a market and then you got to sell it. Exactly, and so for us to at least understand how like assets could impact is a great way to begin the conversation. And then like I think you've heard a number of times here, it depends on what the actual partner's looking for or the customer, and it depends on who's leading your business and allowing them in that area to have the discussion and formulate what it actually should look like. But short answer, yes, it's, it's very different um, okay. over here. Great, uh, just I wanna sort of poll everybody. Um, in media, you've got things like uh, Nielsen and, and um, uh, Repicom and, and, and mm -hmm. other agencies to give you data. Mm -hmm. on, on the more experiential and, and especially on the college side, mm -hmm. what's, your, what's your index? What do you use? Uh, in, in terms of uh, how visible the sponsorship was? How yeah, exactly. Okay, so for, for USC, uh, you know, it's a lot of it's not around those football games that you're running, and so clearly yeah. attendance of the football uh, games is a big thing. Winning right. football games is a great as aspect of it as well. So, but generally, you're, you're, like our college sales cycle has been going on for already two months for next season. So, uh, you know, we're, I, th I think you judge it based on attendance and based on how well you're able to listen to what the client's trying to accomplish at the venue, uh, outside the venue, how we can integrate other assets that are there, because there's many different assets that we have at USC to be able to fulfill uh, client expectations, both locally and national brands as well uh, with USC. So measurement's a little more challenging, though. Um, you know, just, just truly, did, did the advertising you placed at USC move the, brand, uh, move the needle for your brand? And if they're doing things with UCLA, and if they're buying television on broadcast, if they're doing other things, it's hard to kind of pull that out and say, well, this, this actually is what we can measure 
But there's, there's a lot of aspects in the business uh, that we can measure. Uh, the signage of the games, the number of attendees, the number of things that are given out the games, the response, the response that comes back to uh, clients from people who attended the games and coming to their businesses with coupons, with, right. with ticket stubs. Th those are all part of the metrics as well. It, and, and we customize everything for USC in the same way. How do we measure it? We sit down and have that conversation as we're doing the deal. How are we going to measure this? Sometimes it's just as simple as its attendance of the games. And sometimes it's a little more complex than that. Thank you. But on, on the uh, television side, though, um, I, I think that's, that's a little bit harder also because you do have Nielsen, you have other things, but you know, how attaches a consumer to the brand that you're selling, right? So is buying a spot in CSI on CBS as effective as buying a spot in the Boston Celtics? What's the connection, right? So, right. so, so w we measure success by the connection that the consumer has. It's not the number. The number's the number. But if you see a spot in CSI, does that really tell you, you know, what that brand stands for? Does it tell you anything about whether you should be buying it or not? Are you connected to it? Right. Probably not. And I, and I think that's that's a struggle that goes on with with programming versus sports. Yeah, that's what's so cool about your part of the business, though. I mean, it, it really is just real great old school advertising on that part. Well, of it, it is, and and you know, the consumers will say, you know, people who who are home team fans would rather buy a product or service who's with their team. And Chris knows this from. From the, the NBA side of it, we do a lot of research on baseball, hockey, college. It, it, you know, it's, it's all universal, universal. You're fans of a team, you wear a team hat. You don't wear a league hat, you wear a team hat. And the reality is that, you know what, if I love Toyota and Toyota advertise with the Clippers, I love Toyota by default. You've got it. So, you know, it's a very strong connection. I think the great thing about sponsorship is sponsorship helps amplify what brands are already doing and it, it helps cut through the clutter. So brands are spending on traditional advertising and they are spending on social and they are spending on newspaper or radio or whatever it may be. But what sponsorship does is it makes all of that more visible and that lift can be measured. So to the extent that you're already doing those things, we want you to keep doing those things, Mr. or Miss Brand. But what we're saying is the sponsorship will allow all of those things to be more seen. They will be more remembered because of your tie with the team and because of the, the passion the fan has with the team already, it makes all of your marketing more effective. Right. Kristen brought up a great question when we were just sitting in the other room uh, that I, I did want to pose to you, and that is, um, what if the team's losing? How do you, how do you develop that, uh, that energy with it? On average, half of our teams are losing, so yeah. we're, um, <laughs> that's okay. It's yeah. not about that. I mean, the, the partnership should not be based around wins and losses. The partnership, again, is based around what are you trying to accomplish with your brand. So, for example, for somebody like American Express and the things we do with um, Elizabeth and American Express. I mean, for American Express, um, and, and redirect me here, but it's about um, engagement of the cardholders and exclusive unique experiences for cardholders. And you can provide those things and wonderful opportunities, whether you're winning or whether you're not. Mm -hmm. um, the chalk talk for platinum cardholders, the right. behind the scenes tour, the lunch with the coach. There are so many things, unique things that you can do to make a partnership come to life, irrespective of wins and losses, um, that it, it's not something we really talk about because the, the assets and the experiences transcend what just happens on the court. We, we, don't, we don't use the word losing. We, we, we have victory challenge teams, you know, they're victory challenged and you know, we have them every year because we sell all teams in all sports. Uh, it, you know, the reality is, is that uh, I'm a New Orleans Saints fan and for 43 years I can pretty much say that I, I was passionate about a losing team. So uh, there's a hardcore uh, fan base for any team. Uh, Tampa Bay Lightning yes. has a hardcore yes. fan base and when they win, You'll see more uh, consumers on the edge. Maybe people who occasionally watch a game will come in for more games. When they're losing, though, you have that base. You always have a base of fans that are there, that love their team, win, lose, or draw. So I agree. that's the way we treat I agree. it. Great. Thanks. I can tell you in the work that we do for our clients, recapping their, their investments each year in certain teams, never once do we reference the team's record for the year. It's irrelevant. So it's okay. We like your losing teams, too. Right. You've you got a halo. The reality is that, that uh, and I use the Tampa Bay Lightning, right? There was a few years back where they had that run. They went to the mm -hmm. Stanley Cup, right? Well, we were doing sixes and sevens uh, towards the end of the year in the you know, household demo ratings. That's massive. Uh, normally doing a two, right? So uh, triple, triple. And, and all of our sponsors who were there with us through the year, they paid for a two and they got sixes and sevens towards right. the end of the year. Yeah. So it was a good benefit for the sponsor. 
we talked a lot about in, in, in sponsorship and measuring fan engagement, but what about um, at the corporate level? Uh, Mike, in your area and premiums and, and the global portfolio that you represent, it's got to be, um, is it different in corporate? How do you sell the businesses? Yeah, well, I, Elizabeth brought up a great point, and I think you can say this in hindsight when we were going through the economic downturn and hopefully we're out of it, because I might not say the same thing at this point, but looking back on it, it was, it was a great audit over our business. It was a great audit on how we were showing value, how we were providing it, but ultimately how we were justifying right. what we were doing for our customers. Because for a long time, like you said, Gillette, this is what we do. And then a lot of people, they own corporate hospitality, sponsorships, it's like this is what we do. But then when the downturn happened, all these budgets were under review again. So it's just what we do, that didn't, that didn't fly. And so yeah. the, the prospective customers and our current customers were being challenged and they were relaying that to us. Hey, I, I get it. I know that this is effective, but I'm being challenged by my CFO. I'm being challenged in a bunch of different areas on why we're making this spend. And so ultimately what I think it, it pushed us to do was make sure we were positioning our product as truly a solution. Because you know, when you're looking over the budget, what's the first thing that goes? Entertaining, cut. Marketing, cut. So when we were looking through, it's like, okay, we got to make sure our, our conversation's changing a little bit. And uh, part and parcel to that was how do we prove we're saying it's a business solution, but here's how we prove that we're actually hitting your objectives. And so, you know, I, I would say that this whole process of going through has definitely helped us um, be more analytical for the benefit of our corporate uh, partner. You know, I can think of Farmers Field, when they were looking at their corporate hospitality with us, they, they were challenged in trying to understand where the tickets were going, who they were going, and how that process was going. And, and it was through that dialogue and that discovery as we're talking through all the stuff that they had, I said, hey, you know, we need to come up with a solution. Um, which we did, a, a software um, out there that spotlight, I think Tony Knopp and his team spoke here before. But that, that was, I, I think that's a great example of, you know what, we have to get better at justifying or aligning with our partners on how they have to justify things internally. Okay, thanks. Last question before we go to questions is for, for Greg. Greg, um, your, your, uh, your sponsorship with, uh, with the Patriots has been really, really successful. When you sit down with your boss, though, on a, on a, on a, on a yearly review, not on your job, uh, which I'm sure you do a great job. It's usually weekly. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> but on, on the job of the relationship, when it comes to renewal time of that, like what are the metrics that you have to sit down and, yeah. and, 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 and justify that spend? Um, yeah, well, that was a very hard one for us. I mean, we've, it's, you know, it's not in the P and G DNA to, to really do these sports sponsorships, and especially a, right. name, a naming sponsorship like this one. Um, this deal was done before um, before they they absorbed uh, P and G absorbed Gillette. Um, the deal's long term, and it's not something that, especially here in in Boston, we're going to ever try to walk away from. But believe me, those conversations have happened. Right. You know, what's you know, people want to understand what you get and what you're what we're doing. So we've gone and said, okay, you know what, we have this, we, we need to do some more things. We need to interact with the Patriots and your organization better. Um, so we have a much better conversation going than we had four years ago, or five years ago when I started. Um, we need to make sure our signage is effective. We need to make sure, because that's, because we don't activate locally, we activate nationally. Right. So we're able, we need to make sure that, that this, the, here's a winning team that does, is on TV almost every week right. in a major game. Uh, they are in the playoffs, so we, we do benefit from that, and, and we're trying to, to measure that right now. We're doing some, something right now in, in, um, with the Patriots where we're trying to measure what that actually means, and we have to get that into a format where P&G understands what that, what's that means, what that means as well, and that's a little more of a challenge. Um, but yes, we've got to go, when we sit down every year, we talk about it, uh, but it's also something we don't, I can't say we don't pay great attention to, but we don't pay great attention to. We need to do, I mean, we're, tra we're challenged to do that better. Um, and we, we, and the Patriots are great to work with us. With it. We're, we're, we're not the easiest people to work with at times, so. Oh, you guys are marketing geniuses at PNG. I mean, sure. Yeah, I just hand, I just wave my hands over and hope something <laughs> of it comes back here. So, cause it's, it, it's an incredible place. Thank you. Uh, let's go to some questions. Uh, uh, Kristen, is there some questions for us? You can start with one about Greg's shoes. It depends. Yeah, exactly. 
It's a great idea. I mean, I keep saying it, but it's a, it's a great idea. Okay. Okay, here's, uh, with recent scandals of athletes and squeaky clean, ima uh, with squeaky clean images, uh, Pistorius, Armstrong, so on and so on, why do brands still sponsor athletes? Do you want to take a, uh, a <laughs> Please, yeah. <laughs> or who's been bitten by the bug? Um, again, we find athletes are, I mean, we, we, we can't activate locally. That's a challenge for us. And so we have properties. So we'll have a major property like the NFL or Major League Baseball. And we find that athletes are really a, a great way for us to interact with our consumer because, you know, we're looking for our NFL guy uh, this past year. But we, you know, the NFL, the players are moving around. We had to have someone who had a unique look. Uh, that people recognize. So we did, you know, we did do research on that. And Clay Matthews came back as the guy. Uh, but also the strategy came back to where we needed somebody who was a defensive player right. who made an impact on the game and had a unique look. So when you see him, you know who he is. We don't have to tell that story. So we can right. more or less talk about what we're trying to talk about with our razors and our products. Um, but so we, and we have Roger Federer. Um, and, but we've had, we've been bitten too. Um, and you just gotta prepare for that. Um, it's gonna, I mean, I'm gonna continue to do athletes, we're gonna continue to, 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 to have people on our roster, and we're, and we're gonna get bit. You just have to face it and figure out how to deal with it the best way possible. Elizabeth, do you have anything to add? It, it, Greg's absolutely right, it's going to happen at some point in your life that you're gonna make a bet or an investment on a particular athlete and it's not gonna work out for various reasons or they're gonna have an image issue. It'll happen, that's human nature, that's life. But, uh, you know, we put a great deal of rigor into scorecarding it and, and it's against a, a great number of incoming metrics. We can talk about Q scores and we can talk about that, uh, um, all the incoming pro you know, proprietary data that's out there. But at the end of the day, it's about understanding who your brand is, what your brand needs to accomplish, and who authentically can embody that for you. And it may or might, just like teams, it doesn't matter to me, it's irrelevant if they're winning or losing, it's irrelevant to me if this is, this is a guy who is at you know, ranked one or ranked 10, as long as he's the perfect embodiment of my brand and it feels authentic. There are certain players that you, know, I, you, can, you can smell inauthenticity a mile away, and I can guarantee you your consumers do as well, right. and the fans. And when you see the, a mismatched relationship between an athlete and a brand, it's cringeworthy to me. Um, so we spend a lot of time focusing on taking all the input we have from the data sources in the market, but then truly understanding who we are as a brand and what we're trying to accomplish. You know, and when, when it works well and it feels natural, it's the right thing to do, and then you deal with any of the inevitabilities that might happen uh, with some of these issues that come up when they come up. We have one thing we look at. Is, it, is he the best a man can get? Which yeah. is our right. Which is our yeah. right. It's really simple. I mean, it's, I mean, and we look at that and go, okay. And then, and then I go make the other phone calls we got to make to find out who he really is. But aren't, so. you, but aren't you astounded at the number of pitches you get for people who, like, I can imagine you probably have getting, gotten pitches for athletes who don't shave. I got one. I mean, I actually walked around the office yesterday with this one, and I got it. It was, you know, it's a great-looking kid yeah. and nice and a wonderful athlete. Yeah. And, you know, I got it, and the kid's got a full freaking beard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, come on. Stop, yeah. stop it. Make yeah. it shave um, it. Make you know, it shave it. Yeah. Well, yes, but, unwilling but everything it, in his entire, if I go in, in, and look at his entire Google history, everything, every photo in there is a beard. Yes, it may right. make it unique, but, you know, when somebody says, hey, who is this guy? And there's nothing but a beard. Um, yeah. you, know, it's, you know, it's quite interesting. We spend a, um, a, a great deal of time focusing on this authentic relationship of a brand and, and an athlete. And, and, you know, I get pitched all the time for a, a competing athletes and competing brands. And there's one deal we have internal to the house where we put Andrew Luck in with Quaker, which was the most endemic match I could think of. Andrew Luck is the all-American guy. He wow, is yeah. an oatmeal eater. He is about kids. And it made sense and it worked. And then on the flip side, I went completely the other direction and put RG3 in a relationship with Lenovo, who was one of our clients, because they are an edgier brand and have a different relationship and a different message that they're trying to communicate to the market. And I, I giggled to myself all the time, what if I'd switched that? And how inauthentic that would have been and how it wouldn't have worked right for either one of the brands. Right. What about on the other side, where is every brand a customer for a team? 
No, I mean, I, I think there's some transference that exists in sponsorship and, and sort of the idea of birds of a feather flock together. So I, I think there are brands you would not want to associate with. I think there are brands that would not want to associate with a given athlete or a given team or a given property. Um, again, the, like for both the partner and the team or the property, it's about brand building. So you want to make sure you're aligning yourself with brands and prospect or uh, brands and partners that um, sort of drive the authenticity of that relationship. So certainly there's brands that you wouldn't want to work with, and I'm sure vice versa. What about local versus national? I mean, is there any deliberate yeah. sort of balance? I was gonna, I was gonna say that that's probably where it shows up the most. Uh, yeah. You know, so so on some of our regional sports networks when I first came to Fox 14 years ago, we had some of the most bizarre sponsors, like right. just you know lawyers and you know Darius just yeah, just, yeah. just people are like, wow, how'd you even afford a sponsorship? So the last 14 years, I've spent kind of weeding those things out and saying, you know what, big brands need to be here. And so, you know, as, as opposed to having the lawyer and the hospital and all the things that might have been around in local sports, we now have Apple, we now have Miller Coors, we now have AT&T, we now have the big brands with us uh, on a local, regional, national scale. So, so we're, we, we also went through a kind of a weeding out process of the brands that are with us. Because when a consumer's watching at home, they, their impression of your broadcast is based on partly some of the advertisers that are with you. And if you have some really questionable advertisers with you, then it questions the authenticity of your broadcast. So we've, we've spent a great deal of time looking like a national broadcast uh, on the local level. Great. Mike, what's a, it, Mike used to work for the Bobcats. Mike worked for the Cavaliers. Uh, uh, it, you know, and now he's got this great job at, at, at AEG. What, what, what is a, like a category in sponsorship that's growing for, for you guys that, that, you know, the rest of us between, uh, you know, beverage or consumer products or men's products or, you know, auto or everything like that would be a surprise. Be a surprise? Well, it, you know, not to sound like I'm on repeat here, but it, it, it depends on the venue. <laughs> um, it depends on if it's a new build or a current build and what assets are out there. Um, there are certain categories that dominate that we know like certain assets. Um, so you know, it would be it would be tough to say. You know, what about we, in other parts of the world? Like, is yogurt the you know the beer <laughs> of of the, you know Spain or something? I don't know. Yes, yes, that's a huge market. <laughs> yeah, for us. The, no, um, the whole yogurt cartel. You know, so we actually just did a comparison over um, we're calling it where the money's at. Basically, who our current customers and who is currently buying in the UK versus um, here in the States. And ultimately, they were pretty similar. I mean, there's a couple of percentage points. There might be a swap in an industry or two, um, but I, I don't know if I have anything riveting to say that like, here's a new category that just emerged. Just make some up. Um, what, what I would say has, has emerged is the, over the last couple years, the understanding of how these categories use social media and digital. I think when it first came to be, it was, and I still don't, yeah, maybe no one knows how this thing works yet, but there's a, there's much more, a better understanding of being authentic and organic in the conversation, whereas it was very transactional three, four years ago when it came out. And so now you have all these different categories who are looking at it in a similar light, but it's, it, it's still a unique experience to the customer yeah. because of the way they're going about it. Okay, thank you. Chris has got a really interesting job as, as head of Team Bo, as, as he said, he's, you know, he's, he's basically a, a group of business consultants that support the teams in their marketing and, and, and stuff like that. Oh, I didn't know that you were holding up numbers. I didn't know what that was. <laughs> that was being scored. I just got a 10. Great. So. <laughs> Perfect 10 on that question. So, um, uh, so in, in your role sort of as a business consultant, sorry. Um, here's the next question. Sponsorships are multifaceted with, move, with many moving parts. How do you value each one? Examples of valuation and metrics and moving parts, specific analytic tools or metrics or services to help with this? You know, your star report, other things like that in order to, to give value to, uh, to some of these We people. did a um, sort of a pre-workshop yesterday for the NBA team. So we had all 30 NBA teams in yesterday and we were talking about just generally sort of best practices in our analytic world and I thought Toronto gave a sort of a nice case study on um, analytics and sponsorship and, and the way it was framed was 
research can help you, one, sort of quantify the value you're providing to an existing partner, but two, research is important as a conversation starter with potential prospects as well. So when you take both of those together, there's a lot of research that can happen on the front end about where are, I should say, are our fans your customers? To the extent that we can prove that on the front end, um, that's a good way to start a conversation with someone with whom we're talking. Um, and then carrying it through on the other side, it, it's everything we've talked about before. It's to the extent, or the extent to which you can quantify the amount of broadcast exposure your sign is getting during our broadcast, and are there ways we can um, I don't, change the color of your sign, change the location of a sign to make sure your brand gets more exposure during the broadcast is something. Um, there are social media monitoring tools where we can monitor the amount of conversation of your brand in conjunction with ours or the tone of right. that conversation in conjunction with ours, which is also effective. Um, in things we've talked about before, we do sort of proprietary in-house research or we can partner with someone else to measure things like changes in purchase consideration over time, um, changes in brand awareness over time, changes in how I feel about a brand over time. So all of those things we're doing, which again, like it, it just speaks to, yes, sponsorship is really complicated, but it's inherently measurable. Um, and to the extent that you put the discipline into that measurement process, it makes you better at what you do, and it certainly provides additional value to the partner at the end of the day. Right. Last question for um, Elizabeth, and, and, and that is, are, are you using you know, at Wasserman, you guys are, are, you know, a small amount of people that does like an incredible amount of deals. What sort of technology do you use to, 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 to leverage yourselves in order to do those things? From an analytics perspective, yeah. uh, look, we, we absolutely have a process and a discipline that's very firmly right, rooted in data and analytics. We believe that. We believe in it probably more so than anybody in our competitive set. Um, you've got somewhere you have to start from that's quantifiable and defensible um, and repeatable, quite frankly. Uh, and that's what uh, we work very hard on. But, but we also firmly believe that there's both an art and a science to measuring brands and relationships. I mean, this is, an, this is sports, for God's sakes, people. This is a passion-driven industry. And it's really, really difficult to put a quantifiable metric around human passion. So we do what we can from a, uh, an analytics perspective to, as, as Chris said, measure the individual elements, which are absolutely inherently measurable. And then you have to look at the sort of artistic interpretation of that. What did your brand want going in and what did they get coming out? And part of that may or may not be related specifically to a number. So we use a, we use a great deal of incoming syndicated data and then we have our own version of how to apply that that varies very differently brand to brand and sometimes even program to program or property to property within the brand. Um, very, very different application of it and that's the sort of the trick is the blend of the art and the science. Okay, great. Uh, anybody, um, any go-to websites you guys get up in the morning and check in order to stay on top of what's happening in the sponsorship um, I'm, world? I'm a big, um, oh, in the in sponsorship world, I'm a big uh, flip board, but I, I look at all the trades, sure. all, yeah. all the standard yeah. trades, uh, you know, Ad Week, multi-channel news, uh, Sports Business Journal. Right. So they're all there. But uh, Flipboard's my favorite app. I mean, that's got everything I want. Great. Love it. Mike, after you get done with TMZ.com. I, <laughs> I usually go to weather.com. Weather.com. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I think you've read a lot through all this. Okay. I, I, am a, I am a shill for our teams. Yeah. Um, and we have an internal site called TeamNet. So TeamNet is an internal site where all of our teams can put their best practices. Right. So in a sortable fashion, if you want to see the best activation ideas for a fast food chicken restaurant, you can see the top five ideas in our league. If you want to see the best um, social media activations for credit card companies, you can see that there, and so on and so on and so on. So TeamNet is our storehouse for everything we do. Um, all of our team employees across all three of our leagues have access to it, and it's just such a wonderful tool of inspiration that that's where I go to. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Greg, how about you? Usually I'm checking the P&G email for, <laughs> if I can dig out from <laughs> under that. Um, but no, sports business, and there's a couple of you know, the stuff, things that are going on in Europe. I, I tap right into Asia and Europe when I get up and 
see what's going on over there because that's usually what I have to deal with as soon as I get up is, is what's happening uh, globally before it, the stuff comes out in the U.S. Elizabeth? Same thing. I've spent a lot of time looking at the traditionals, the ad week, the brand week, the sports business, and all of those. But firm believer in shopping in your own closet. So when I really want to know what's going on, I take a look at what our athletes are doing and tweeting about, what our brands are investing in and writing about, and learn a lot more about that than from any other source. Oh, that's great. Well, I want to thank everybody. I mean, you know, my business partner, Todd, when we uh, were putting the panel together, we were reaching out to people and we were like, this is like having a dinner party and having like all these like the Hollywood stars showing up for Todd and I in our business and how we're sort of, you know, uh, you know, in a support role for a lot of this stuff. But like to have you guys and, 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 and where you are in your, in, in your own organizations come and, and, and sit on my panel, I really, really appreciate it. And I, I hope for the audience you, you got some value out of it. Um, I hope that we get some resumes, uh, everybody here, because it's a really interesting area of, uh, of business to be involved in. And we're hiring. Yeah, we're hiring. Uh, they're hiring. Everybody, yeah, uh, but we're, but we're really one. hiring. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I want to thank everybody for, uh, for, for staying for the hour and, and, and listening for the questions. And again, thank you very much for the great conversation. Thanks, guys.